I'm really honored to introduce my good friend and well-known abalone diving historian, Scrap Lundy. Uh, Scrap is originally from the Midwest, and he's been a Santa Barbara resident here since 1969. His passion for diving began in the 1950s. There was no training available back then, so Scrap learned how to dive by reading the instruction book from the equipment manufacturers back in the day. So it was kind of kind of trial and error. Um, he started diving in a Iowa rock quarry um, way back in the in Midwest, which where he, he hails from. Uh, some of you are wondering why his name is Scrap. Well, his dad worked at a steel mill, and the uh, his colleagues there tend to call him a little scrap piece of steel, so the, the name kind of stuck. Upon graduating from Marquette University in 1961, he was commissioned an ensign in the United States Navy. 1963, he volunteered for the Naval Explosive Ordnance Disposal, uh, rather rigorous and, and dangerous duty. Uh, part of the EOD training consisted of graduating from the Navy's Combat Divers Swimmer School down in Key West. A lot of you are familiar with that being ex-divers. Uh, he qualified as a second-class Navy diver, uh, and the training included both scuba and full face mask gear, the old Jack Brown gear, as well as the U.S. Navy Mark V helmet. Uh, after serving in Vietnam, disarming mines uh, with the Navy SEALs on land and underwater mines, he left the Navy in 1966, and he worked for the Underwater the Division of Redding and Bates Offshore Drilling Company. Now, while there, he made numerous dives to 300 feet with Comex divers using scuba, along with Trimix as a breathing gas, so rather ahead of the, of the curve there at the time. In 1968, he joined Cal Dive Incorporated in Santa Barbara, and it was here that he befriended many of the former Abalone divers from our area. Uh, Bob Ratcliffe, who was there tonight, where's Bob? There he is, his laddie here tonight. Uh, Whitey, Stephens and Whitey Stephens is here. Uh, so Scrap worked with uh, all of those Abalone diving pioneers and commercial diving pioneers. Okay, so uh, after he left uh, Cal Dive, uh, he left commercial diving industry, and he went into the investment business. And then later on in 1970, he had his first encounter with abalone while sport diving. Now, from 1974 to 1976, he worked as a commercial abalone diver off his locally made Radden boat, which uh, everybody's familiar with. Uh, he continues his passion for diving today, and he actually comes out on dives with me at, uh, at City College when we, uh, we go out on dive trips. Uh, Scrap's a founding director of the Historical Diving Society, uh, and he's the author of the Abalone uh, Diving Industry, California Abalone Diving Industry, a pictorial history. Now, this book is out front for sale, and I'm here to tell you that those three boxes that you see out front are the last ones they have from the publisher. Um, so this book, I don't know if it'll go to a, another printing or not, but these are, this is a very well-researched book and a seminal piece of work. Uh, so if you're looking for a copy, Scrap has some, and he's happy to sign them. He may even be able to coerce uh, Mr. Ratcliffe and Mr. Steffens to put their mark in there, too. Anyway, uh, Scrap is affectionately known in my household as the world's greatest guy, uh, and rightly so, because every now and then he shows up with a an abalone that he's taken on a free diving trip up in Northern California. Uh, you couldn't ask for a better friend, and I'm here to, uh, in, in, in both ways. <laughs> I'm really pleased to have Scrap here talk to you tonight and uh, have him as a friend. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Scrap Lundy. Thank you, Don, for that nice introduction. And thank you to the uh, Santa Barbara Maritime Museum for allowing me to make my presentation this evening. And thank all, I'd like to thank all of you people for coming tonight. I deeply appreciate it. Now, what you see here, or have seen, is my daughter and I up the coast about 18 years ago. Uh, and those of you who are fathers and have daughters know that if your daughter says she'd like to have something, it's probably a pretty good idea to produce it. So she wanted abalone for dinner, so we went out and got an abalone for dinner. Uh, before we get into the show, I have to give you the background of the, of the industry, before we get into the pictorial show, that is. And as the industry started in 19, 1893, excuse me, 1853, by the Chinese in, in uh, 
Monterey. They, they were coming over here as, as uh, workers, of course, for the uh, gold fields. And they were told that there was a golden mountain, was a term that was used, and all you had to do was to find it and stick your, line your pockets with gold and come back to China and retire a wealthy man. Well, we know how that worked out. Yeah, it didn't. And uh, so, so some of the uh, workers had been from seaside towns in China. And so they, when the uh, Golden Mountain didn't work out, they went to seaside towns in uh, California. And one of them was Monterey. And there they found these huge red abalone bigger than that, just plastered all over the rocks. And in, and in, the, in China, abalone is a real delicacy, but they're much smaller than this. So they just knew that their new Golden Mountain was not in the, in the hills, it was in, on the sh seashore. And so they, uh, I have an 18, no, 53 copy of it, uh, 53 article from the California Alta, which was the San Francisco Chronicle of the day. And uh, saying there's a mad abalone rush to Monterey, and I didn't know if the, the abalone were rushing to Monterey or if, it, <laughs> or if the Chinese were rushing to run away. But in any event, they got down there, and uh, their method of harvesting was to pry them off the rocks one at a time between tides, preferably at low tide, and uh, then they would build a little shanty town all the way from Monterey down to Baja. That's how industrious these folks were. And uh, they would then take the, the meat out of the shell, clean off the viscera, and put it into a big pot to boil it for a couple of, a couple of days, a pot about the size of the uh, whaling pot downstairs, and uh, then bag it up in bags and then send it to uh, China. Uh, in 1882, the U.S. government, in all its wisdom, passed the Exclusion Act, which made it impossible for a number of reasons for the Chinese to remain in the abalone industry. So they, they, were, they were finished. And the industry lay dormant until 1897, when a Japanese immigrant by the name of Mr. Uh, Osterboro Noda found a or rediscovered the abalone in Monterey again, just like the Chinese had years before. And so he sent word to Tokyo that uh, what he had found, that all these huge red abalone all over the beach, all over the rocks in front of Monterey and down south. And so uh, they sent a marine biologist by the name of Janusky Kodani to uh, <clears throat> to investigate this. Well, he came over and, uh, have to pardon me while I turn this thing on. This is uh, Point Lobos, and this is Whaler's Cove, and he chose this area to set up shop uh, for his original diving and uh, abalone operation. If you've never been to Point Lobos, I would strongly suggest if you have a chance to go there. It is so beautiful, it's beyond words. And the little museum there, which of course isn't as good as this one, is there, is fascinating. So he came over and he, he brought a couple divers with him. Um, whoops. These are the first two commercial California abalone divers. <laughs> really? <laughs> Uh, you see they have these little cotton suits on and the basket as it was called is remained designed and remained unchanged for a hundred years and they got their pry bars here and their goggles now what nobody realized was where they came from in Japan uh, the Chiba prefecture which is like a county was the same latitude as Monterey so hence the water temperature should be the same right no. Wrong. And uh, it's 10 degrees, 10 to 15 degrees colder here than there. So that's why they brought these up, their little suits. Uh, and so Mr. Godani knew what was on the bottom out there, nothing but blocks of gold, so to speak. 
And uh, he said, okay, guys, go get them. Well, the guys went to go get them, and uh, they got out real quick. And it's, it wasn't recorded what they told Mr. Gadani he could do about getting abalone. <laughs> but Mr. Gadani was a man of great foresight, and he sent for three heavy gear divers. Well, they appeared in 1898 in Monterey. And that was the beginning of the diving for abalone in California. 1898 in Point Lobos. That's uh, nope, the wrong one. I wanted for those of you who haven't seen abalone underwater, this is what they can look like. These they can be on the top of. We're going to get to see the show twice doing this. Just hit that forward button here. Just this one once. Okay. Okay. That one there. And they can be on the side of rocks like here or on the top or down. There's one hiding down here that you can't see. And all the diver would do is stick his iron, as it was called in here, pop the abalone off and stick it in his basket and keep on going. Now this is the first Japanese dive boat, if you can call that a boat. Uh, they had a two-handed air pump which supplied the diver with air. And you can barely see it. Oh, darn. No, it, it's too early for that for dinner. Just press lightly on it once. You're holding down too long. Okay. I'm getting hungry just watching this. <laughs> and I've seen it a million times. Okay. There's the dive boat and the air pump. There's the air pumps, two handed air pumps that were on the boat. Darn this thing. Too many buttons. Do you want me to do the clip? Yeah. Okay, just tell me what you want next. There's one moving part, and that's one too many for me, so. <laughs> Don, I'll take it. Okay, here's. Okay, you want to go back? Yeah. Okay. Here's a dive boat in action, and the oar you see sticking off the stern is a sculling oar. And he, he provided all the power for the boat and, the, and steered it all day long. And the diver's on the ladder there, and you can see the air pump in action, hopefully. And the, uh, the man in the bow is handling the air line and, and the uh, lifeline. Now, the way these guys dived in those days was they, they would bend over probably further, much further than this at, at the waist or the knees because they had to be close to the bottom to see the abalone and be able to get to them. So it wasn't just walking along like in a park picking abalone off the rocks. It, it was very, very difficult work in that suit and they had the port, the port in front was four inches, long, four inches wide so that's all they had to see through. So the diver would walk along the bottom and the boat would follow him. It's called live boating. And uh, the diver would stay down anywhere from four to eight hours a day, depending on the weather or the winds or the year or, the, or the, uh, what time of year it was. And they'd transfer the abalone from the bottom to the boat by this method. They had a lifeline. And uh, on the lifeline would, would be a hook. So he, the diver would give a signal send down an empty basket so he put the diver would pull it down put the on the put on the loaded basket send it back up and there he then he'd take off again with the empty basket so that was a very efficient way to do things um, this is another scene showing the uh, air pump and the, and the crew, there's a crew of about seven or eight men on here and they rotated constantly 
between the air pump and the uh, uh, handling the lines and the air hoses, et cetera. But the scholar never changed. He got to do that all day long. Now, when they picked out uh, Whaler's Cove, pretty much, they had to go down the coast. So the Japanese had a different way of doing this. Um, they had the mother boat, uh, the white one with the flag on it, that had a big engine in it. That would tow the dive boat. And this boat is coming back from a trip. If you look closely, the dark spot on the bow of the uh, dive boat is the, uh, uh, the abalone. And uh, the mother boat would tow it in the, into the harbor and uh, uh, tie it up wherever it was supposed to go for the night and unload the abalone and, and uh, process them and go out the next day, weather permitting. This is a Japanese dive boat. You can see the skull sticking over the stern. And um, the diver's on the, uh, is on the ladder on the port side. And uh, there's the air pump in action. And uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, about seven, seven or eight guys on that boat. That white, that white thing there you see is the air hose going down. Now this boat, this is Pacific Grove, and that big building in the middle is still there. It's a bed and breakfast. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and some of the natives up there told me that when I did this in the 90s, that a lot of the other buildings were still there also. And this boat had to be sculled from Monterey Harbor, if you can believe that. Or imagine yourself doing that with all these guys on it and the equipment and a big air pump down to, down to this space, place to dive. So... Um, they dive all day and probably put 75 dozen on uh, or so and then he, he got the skull of his way all the way back which I'm guessing is about two miles so that's a long way to spend the day now the Japanese tried to get the Californians to uh, eat abalone and it just didn't work um, I have one of these cans that was made around probably 1910, and on the back of this are three wonderful recipes for soup and chowder and salad to use the diced up abalone in the cans. But it just never worked. It just never went over. And uh, so that died a slow death. Now this is Cayucas in 1905. Now the Japanese only got here in 19, 1898, so in seven years, they had come down the coast, and I, I would guess that there was 15,000 at least abalone here. Wow. I tried to count them one time and multiply it by <laughs> an unknown figure and uh, came up with 15,000. Sounds good, doesn't it? It's probably more than that. Now, uh, this is Cayucas, which had all the attributes that it, Point Lobos did. It had flat land for drying the abalone. It had a, that pier there which is still there, by the way, but the, the pilings are different. And uh, that's where they'd ship them out of. And also there's plenty of abalone in the water around there. So this was an ideal place for them. But all of that in just seven years is fantastic. This is Mr. Aoki. He's getting ready to uh, make a dive. His, his breast is, if you can see his shoes, it gives new meaning to the term tie your shoes on. Uh, and and the breastplate down the, there, that would go up up into a suit. Um, and then the helmet would go on that, and they put a. Of course, they put his arms in the suit already, and then, uh, and put a bell around him that had the air hose attached to it and and his lifeline, and. Uh, away, away you go. Now, this gentleman is responsible for the way we eat abalone today. And we all owe him a great big round of applause or medal or something. He's Pops Ernest Dolter. And about, he came to Monterey around 1906 or 1907. And he had several small restaurants 
that he made abalone very popular in, but it was just in Monterey. And he discovered that if you slice it thinly, or fairly thinly, and pound the daylights out of it because it's all solid muscle, and then put it in an egg batter and put it in breadcrumbs or cracker crumbs or whatever you want, and then fry it quickly on both sides, you had something people would kill for. <laughs> that, that's, now that, that's true, and it's even more true today because there are far less abalone, so the amount of death, or, death rate is going up with the <laughs> population going down. So there he, there's he standing on his, uh, the porch of his res last restaurant. Oh, that, now that's from his place. And I have the, and I can't remember the, uh, I meant to look it up, the, uh, the price of that dinner uh, was either 85 cents or $1.20. Yeah. <laughs> right, Jesus, you know, it's not fair. That was his restaurant, and it burned in, in 53, I think. So it's gone now. But he was quite a guy, and he's the one we have to thank for the, the reason we enjoy abalone so much today. Because by itself, as you probably know, it's a very bland tasting. Here's part of the Japanese abalone fleet. Um, there's a dive boat made up alongside uh, the mother boat, as they call them, and uh, various other boats in the fleet. This crewman is putting abalone in the uh, net to take it up to Fisherman's Wharf, where the Japanese had all their processing shops. This is Mr. Cadone, and he's outside the Point Lobos Canning Company. And if you look at those with a, with a magnifier, if you look at those abalone, each one is probably, I'm guessing, at least eight inches long and up to 10 inches. And it's just monsters, just absolute monsters. Now here's a dive boat in action. You see the sculling man standing on the stern? Okay. And he's, he'll be moving the boat as soon as the diver gets in the water. And uh, the man with the white hose is handling the air hose. <clears throat> and there's another man, the guy with the uh, long, the bib overalls on, and has the uh, lifeline. So the diver would drop down to the bottom and start walking in a manner I explained before and putting abalone in the basket. And then they make that transfer and he keep on going like all day long. He only come up three or four times for a rest break or uh, food or uh, call of nature. Now this is the gear that was on the dive boat that the diver would have to get into on the way to the dive site. There's a suit over there on the right. And uh, then there's the, uh, Don, would you, would you get the exhaust valve on the helmet, please? Right there, yeah. If you keep that in mind for, for future use, uh, it would be very valuable to you. Um, and the breastplate and the weights over, over here. The front weight was about 34, 35 pounds, and the back weight was around 32. And uh, the shoes, which you don't see here, were about 17 to 18 pounds each. Now people say, well, why in the world would you need so much weight if, if you're just going down to the bottom and, and getting abalone. Well, what they don't realize is the suit itself is a giant buoyancy con, uh, container. And unless you get rid of the excess air to that exhaust valve that Don pointed out, uh, and, it, and on the inside of it was a little head button where you go like this and dump air to, for fine tuning your buoyancy, that plus the weight would keep you on the bottom. Otherwise, you, you would call what they call blow up like this, and you couldn't move your hands or legs or anything because it, the suit was filled full of air. So there's, uh, that's Mr. Taki. He was the best diver in the uh, 30s, according to the, the guys in Morro Bay and Monterey. And uh, he only spoke two words of English, and it was 50 dozen, 50 dozen. And, it, they, <laughs> and they, they'd say to him, uh, the old timers up there told me, uh, how you doing today, Taki? And he'd say, 50 dozen, 50 dozen, which is probably what he got. I mean, he wasn't making it up. He was, he was that good. Now, the Japanese had to go further and further down the coast. 
to get their uh, supply of abalone. This is a uh, mother boat with probably, they try to get 150 to 200 dozen per trip. And a trip was 300, I mean 300, two, three to five days. So that's one diver doing all that. So you can imagine the work effort on all these people's part. So what they're doing here is putting the abalone into this basket or ba the box that would go up to the uh, uh, processing shops on Fisherman's Wharf. Next. Now, these are Japanese ladies, and look at the small size of the hammer that they're using, for good reason, because they, were, they weren't very hefty. And uh, this is a, what they're sitting on was a bench that was, they use in Japan, and they rebuilt them over here. It made it halfway comfortable for her to sit there and do that all day. Now, this is a processing line in a Japanese uh, abalone shop. The one man in the operation, you could see him at the very end with the bare arms. The rest of the work was done by women. And he, all he did was take the abalone meat out of the shell because it, that, that was hard. That was difficult to do. So then he passed it down both lines on each side and they trim and clean and everything else you have to do to abalone to make it uh, ready for this lady who had a hand-operated slicing machine. If you can believe that, stand there doing that all day long. Uh, hopefully they switched off, but that's the way it was done. No power, all by hand. This is uh, Lover's Cove again. Where'd you go? Lover's Cove. Not Lover's Cove. Uh, Point Lobos. You're right, thank you. Now, the uh, it's all covered with trees now. Otherwise... Uh, uh, they didn't have, they wouldn't have had any flat land to dry the abalone on, and that's Mr. Kodani, right in the front, in the front, with the black hat on. Um, and there's actually a sec section of land developed or devoted to the Kodani family, on, on this, in this part of the uh, peninsula. This is the fleet in 1931, and that's. Point Lobos behind us, and Don, could you get that little building, white building? That's the museum. Oh. <laughs> it's a, today, I think it's about 170 years old, and uh, it's not quite as good as this museum, of course. And uh, in it, it, it is really worth going to, because there are examples of the, every culture that lived in the area. The uh, Indian, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Portuguese, and then there's a lot of movies were made there, and there's artifacts from that. It, it's just truly worthwhile going to, and that area now is all covered with beautiful pine trees, which makes this a just a wonderful, wonderful place to go. Now this is the only known picture of a Japanese workboat in action. Uh, Don, could you hit the, those bubbles right to the right of the boat? That's the diver's bubbles, and then the uh, steersman, or the oarman, was keeping the boat right there, and the other tender was handling the lifeline and the uh, air hose. He, he'd make the exchange between the baskets, the empty, and the full ones. And then uh, how he could do that, he must have been so skillful, it was just beyond belief, to keep that boat in that position and then follow the diver around. Hopefully they didn't get too much closer to the rocks. But anyway, he, he was uh, enabled, he, he was able to, to do that, which was, to me, just incredible. Now this is Roy Hattori's family boat. Roy was the oldest surviving Japanese American diver who passed away last Christmas day, and he was 92. And he's just about the finest guy you could ever possibly want to meet. And that, this was their mother boat, the Tanami, and that was his dive boat, a Sino boat, the A-23. And he told me before, I got to, be, I got to know him very well, and he, he told me that when they were interned in early 42, uh, they were given 10 days to get their things together before they get 
put on trains and sent off to nowhere. And uh, he couldn't sell a Tanami, so they, and he got $300 for the A23 and all the dive gear on it. So somebody got a real deal, uh, kind of a forced basis. Here's Roy, he, he's about 17 or 18 there, and he got into abalone diving because, so his brother could go to school, and he did, he went on and became a doctor. And he's getting ready to have his helmet put on and uh, make a dive. Now I put this picture in, because this is a modern picture obviously, but if you look closely, you will see he's dressed exactly the same as way as the divers were in 1898 when they came here. So uh, they figured they didn't need to make any changes, so they didn't, and he did well enough. Uh, and most, incidentally, most divers in Japan, ab divers, are women who hold their breaths and dive. And the, the, some areas allow this. There's a little basket that Roy made that's in the museum. These are Japanese picking tools that were, it's in the museum also. Now here's a, the end of a su successful five day trip, I would say. There are probably at least 200 dozen there. And th the boat is made up alongside Fisherman's Wharf and uh, the, the abalone would be put into lifted devices of some type or another and taken up to the processing shops, which are all on Fisherman's Wharf. Today, oddly enough, uh, or in the book, it, it tells uh, what's there now as to what was there, what, what Japanese family had the, the uh, shop, and uh, they're all restaurants. Mm -hmm. So, next. Try and push it as hard as I can. <laughs> Greg, you want to hit the space bar up there? Now, meanwhile, back in Morro Bay, <laughs> there was a, excuse me for a second, I want to take a snort here. Um, there was a fledgling abalone industry, and it was called shore picking. They did it like the Chinese did. They pry them off the rocks. They'd have to go up the coast just a ways because there, were, there was a lot of sand around Morro Bay. And they'd pick them off the rocks and clean them, take them out of the shell, clean them, and then put them in an ice tub and put them on a high-speed Model T truck and send them to San Luis Obispo to get on the train to make the train trip to uh, up north to sell them. So... Uh, in the hills behind Morro Bay, there was a family called the Pierce family. And they were extremely industrious, hardworking, and they were involved in the uh, abalone business. Most everybody in town at the time, there were 400 people in Morro Bay then, uh, were involved one way or the other in the abalone business, either on a part-time or full-time basis. And so they, they would decided that there was a better way to do this He would look, Bill Pierce uh, is a man in a suit there. And he was the oldest brother of, of the family. And he, would, he was the leader also, and very inventive, very strong, and very courageous. And he looked down, and he'd see the Japanese boats and the dive boats, and he'd say, now, there's got to be a better way to do this than what we're doing now. Now, he was in a diving suit, and he walked in over the rocks to get into the water, if you can believe that. Let's say 150 pounds of gear on, walking in over these slippery rocks. It just, and I, I had no idea, and his, his relatives, uh, before they passed away, didn't have any idea how many trips like that he took, but it couldn't have been too many, because he'd go back up and look at the Japanese boats again and say, uh, they, they, maybe they've got something going there, so. Uh, <laughs> He put together a small boat in Monterey, or Morro Bay rather, it didn't work out, it was too little, it was a one-cylinder one diesel engine, and it didn't have enough oomph to it. So he went to Monterey and got the Sino boat, which is made by the Italian boat building family, the Sino's, S-I-I-N-O, and the building they used, the Mon Monterey Boat Works is still there, 
It's uh, run, run by uh, Hopkins Marine now, and it's about two blocks from the uh, aquarium. So now what's important here is, uh, Don, are you up there? I am. Okay. Can you put the flasher on the uh, boat operator? Okay. You see, he's got these. Pardon? Okay. He's got two sticks in his hand. Now, one stick was for the gas, and the other stick was for the gears. And there was a tiller, and he had one foot on the tiller, one for him on the boat, and he hung on by having the gas stick and the gear stick. Now, these guys didn't know any better. They were gold miners. And so everything you they did, they, they did it the hard way, according to our view, because we know better now, of course, but they didn't. They were, they were just that courageous and, and full of zest and everything and saw a better, better way to make money. And uh, now here he is, the boat operator. You can see that in his left hand, the uh, stick going down, that, that goes down to either the gas or the gears in the engine compartment. And one of his feet is on the tiller. So wow. can you imagine running a boat like that in flat water, much less when it's a little rough? <laughs> can't, I, I can't imagine that. This is the Pierce processing shop in Morro Bay. Uh, what you can't see is see them writing up above his head with the sanitary instructions, which said, uh, don't spit on the floor. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> and beneath it is a price list. If, a pound of real thick, beautiful, pure white red abalone was 40 cents. And if it, if it was a little colored a little bit, it was 35. The color didn't change the taste any, but it just, for aesthetic appeal, I guess. So th this is a processing shop in Morro Bay in the 50s. Uh, we're into the machinery era now, and she's trimming or he's trimming rather, and there's more trimming going on. Look at that. Now when she picks this up, look how big the bottom is. Look at that. Can you see that on your plate for dinner tonight? Now here's a hammer. Now watch the big hammer he's got there. Compared to what the Japanese use. That's a five pound hunk of eucalyptus. This is Bill Pierce, and I unfortunately didn't have the pleasure of meeting him because he died way before I came along. And he's on the, on the ladder of his boat taking a break, and he died underneath, hanging about 10 feet underneath his boat, and that happened because his air hose got wrapped into the propeller oh. and cut the air off, so he asphy asphyxiated hanging beneath his boat. He had two crewmen, but neither one could swim. So they couldn't, they couldn't go down and cut his air hose and, and drag him to the ladder by the uh, lifeline. So he was gone, and he was, he was the instigator of the, the uh, Morro Bay abalone industry and a re just a real, real outstanding man. Uh, as a result of his accident, uh, years later, there was a device invented called the bailout bottle, which the divers would put a flask of air on, this, on their belts We'll see a few in just a moment. There's one in the uh, abalone display down there, and I strongly suggest you take a look at the display on your way out because it's really, really nice and it has a lot of good stuff in it that we will be mentioned tonight, the bailout bottle being one. So uh, he was a real loss. Now this is getting into heavy gear on a boat. He's putting soap on his hands so they'll go through the uh, cuffs on the suit. He's putting the straps on for the uh, helmet. And there it goes, the weights. Wow. Looks like an apple and he bit the tender's hand there, doesn't it? <laughs> and he just put a safety device down on her back so the helmet can't come loose accidentally. Now this is 
heavy gear diving in the 50s. Uh, that was the end of that. Now this is a strange picture because of the, ge the gear this man is, he's one of the Pierce's, Les Pierce. And they just didn't know what the word, I can't do it, or fear was. He's got Navy weights hanging there where he should have the, the Japanese type. And he's got a Navy air valve, air, air, yeah, air valve there. And where he got, we get those, Lord only knows. But they'd figure out a way to scrounge gear and, and make this thing work no matter what they had to do. They were just really remarkable in the, in the individuals. <coughs> now, this is Del Mar Rivia with his natty little uh, sea otter hat on, and that's a 14-foot octopus that jumped him on the bottom. Oh. <laughs> and his family told me that a 19-footer got him one day. So what would happen is they'd be walking along, as I said, at an angle about like this, and uh, all they could do is see through the, the, the four-inch port, uh, and all of a sudden a tentacle would come over there <laughs> and pull him back over. Or, or pull him down somehow or another. So he immediately signaled on the signal line because they didn't have voice communications at that time. Take us up, and the top side, of course, didn't know who us was. And uh, <laughs> they peel off. Could, could you hold that one one second? They, they peel off the uh, the uh, tentacles off the diver and put the abalone, which are very pliable, into a basket, and then save it and trade it to the Italian fishermen back in. Morro Bay when they when they return for the day. I think I mentioned that I mentioned that he was jumped by a 19 footer one time, yeah. and that the Pierce some of the Pierces told me that there were areas up there that they wouldn't go into because of the octopus, and if the Pierces wouldn't go in there. Uh, <laughs> nobody else should either. Here's Delmar Rivia again, coming up for a smoke break. Of course, he didn't know that smoking was more dangerous than the diving at the time. <laughs> now, this is Frank Brebs, one of the founders of the Santa Barbara abalone industry. And you can see, Don, can, can you point the bell bottle on his belt? Or are you still doing the batteries? You see that round container sticking out from his back? Okay, that's like about the size of a fire extinguisher. That, that's the bailout bottle there. Now up on his breastplate, there's a, a hose fitting that would, the air would go into. So all he had, if he needed air, he would just <coughs> turn on the uh, handle and then he'd get air flowing in through the breastplate. He's double checking the length of the abalone there to make sure that uh, they're the right size. And here comes a load of California Maritime Gold over the side. There must be at least a couple dozen. This is the Abilene Fleet in Morro Bay in 1937. This is an army duck from World War II that was in San Simeon. And uh, they'd anchor their boats there and go up to Becca's Reef, which was the most prolific red area in the state, and uh, bring the abalone ashore in the duck and take, take themselves and supplies out in the morning to uh, work for the next day. This is Neil Williamson riding the ladder, which unless he's tied to the boat is not a good idea. And we all know why by now, don't we? Because if he falls off without that helmet on, he's had it. Next. Here's another basket of abalone coming over the gunnel. Now here's a great shot of the uh, man with his foot on a tiller. And he's got the sticks in his hand. So I still wonder about these guys. Um, I, I asked one of them, well, why didn't you uh, put a steering wheel on there? Well, we never thought about it. <laughs> this is 1939. This is a Sylvester family, a Portuguese family from Avila. <coughs> There's his bubbles. This was a family movie they gave me. 
And here he's pulling up a basket. Now the, the ladder's down now, so the diver's coming up. <clears throat> he brought up his last basket, and he's on the ladder now, and now they're going to take the helmet off. <laughs> this is uh, George the Greek. And Don, could you point out the uh, bailout bottle on his waist? There it is again. So most of them wore those things. Now, you can see how much air he's got in his suit. He's got to be working the air control valve on a helmet. Otherwise, he's going to turn into the Michelin man, <laughs> and he won't be able to get aboard the boat because you can't move if you're like this. So I'm sure he took care of that by dumping air from the uh, exhaust valve or opening it from the outside. Now, in 1942, the war started, of course, and the U.S.'s supply of gelidium, or called agar-agar, all came from Japan, and it was cut off, of course. So uh, the fleet went down from Morro Bay to Newport Beach, where this photo was taken, to help with the war effort and harvest agar-agar. So uh, during that time, two divers, Charlie Pierce and... Uh, Frank Brebs decided they want, didn't want to do this anymore because it was pretty rough diving by being beaten up in the uh, surf all the time about where you had to be. And uh, so they took off for Santa, for uh, Morro Bay. They wanted to go back to the abalone business. And uh, on the way, they stopped here, here being Santa Barbara. And the islands had just been opened for commercial harvesting. They'd been closed up until that time. So they decided to go out. They'd snuck out there before a few times, they told me. They knew there were tons of abalone there. So they went out and they got 100 dozen the first day, 100 dozen the second day, and 100 the third day. Then they'd, they'd truck them up to uh, Morro Bay and uh, process them. And then it dawned on them, this is ridiculous. Why don't we open a, a shop in Santa Barbara also besides Morro Bay? So they did, and it was on the end of Stern's Wharf. And those of you who were here in the early 60s, which I wasn't, might remember that great big building out there. Well, I couldn't find a photograph of that, no matter how hard I looked. But that's where their shop was. And uh, uh, there are a couple others that had shops out there, too. But the fish were very well fed in that area. From all the trimming that going on, they just <laughs> put it in the water. Uh, now, this is looking over the tender shoulder, and you, you see the the dark line going into the dirty water, that's the air hose. So the, there you go. And uh, you see how quickly the, the visibility gets bad. And the uh, tender and the boat operator had to be work as a team to keep them from running over the air hose. Now this is calm water. Can you imagine what it would be like in rough water doing that? And, and, and to keep the uh, propeller from going over the air hose and wrapping it up, it was called being wrapped. And you didn't want, to, you didn't want that to happen. Uh, there's a nice red on the bottom. This is 1952 at a Hollister Ranch, uh, a baby army duck that was used to bring the abalone in from the dive boats out there to the uh, truck to take them to the processing shop and take supplies back out to the uh, dive boat so they could keep on going the next couple of days. This is a pickup boat, as it was called, a Fulton G, and a dive boat transferring abalone from one to the other. <laughs> this is transferring abalone now. This is from one boat to the other. And tell me this wouldn't get old in a hurry. <laughs> Boy, you'd have a sore back after that. This is in the 50s. This is Ted Benton, one of the best divers around and a highly regarded individual. And uh, when he passed away about eight years ago, a bench was put out front in his honor that had the, the bronze plate on it with his name in, his, in memoriam for Ted. He was just a wonderful, wonderful man and a great diver. 
Here he is with two parts of a breastplate that were left. Now, he wasn't on the boat today, but there was a diver, he told me, who had on his shoes and his breastplate and no helmet. And a wave comes along and knocks him off the boat. So down he goes, and he dies. So Ted just happened to be diving in the same area about a year later, and that's all he found. No weights, no bones, no anything except that. And he gave me that big circle there. It was very nice of him to do that. But uh, that shows you how you never knew what could go wrong at any moment. This is Frank Webb's helmet. This is 1898 Japanese style again. It's been modified. Uh, bigger port put in so you could see better. Don, would you show them where the uh, bailout bottle connection is? Yeah, right there. That's where the emergency air supply would go in. This is the fleet up the coast waiting for opening day to go up to Beckett's Reef and see what they could do for harvesting abalone. Now this is the infamous Black Fleet and Barney Clancy's. They were all superb divers <clears throat> and they operated out of here, out of San Pedro. This one was taken in Wilmington and what they do is go out every day, load the boat with abalone, come back, unload the boat, and then go out and get loaded themselves, and then <laughs> repeat the process the next day. I mean, they, they were a real bunch. They were just, um, the, the true stories I learned from, from writing this book, I couldn't put it in a book because nobody would believe them. And, and they're true. So I, I, it's, I decided to leave them out. There's a pink abalone on the bottom. This is Charlie Pierce on San Miguel Island. He was half Native American Indian. And I said to him, Charlie, what in the world were you doing with that? He said, I was looking for some of my relatives. <laughs> he said, but I don't think I'll find any. Now, anybody have any idea where that picture was taken off of? Palos Verdes in the early 50s. Let's, let's talk development, huh? <laughs> So the diver's getting his helmet uh, put on, and he's going to step off the boat. And here he is coming up, and he's being towed. Uh, see, he's operating his exhaust valve here, making sure that's he's letting out enough air, or letting letting some stay in. And then that see that long hook, or that long pole with a hook on it. That was called yeah. That was called a a kelp knife, because <clears throat> it wasn't too unusual that they'd be in such thick kelp that they couldn't pull a diver up through it. And the divers, all, everything on them would get tangled in the kelp, and, and uh, so they'd have to use that kelp hook to try and cut them free. Well, yes, sometimes it did hit the airline. And that's when the bailout bottle came, became very handy. <laughs> now that cocktail flag tells, tells you all you need to know about this picture. <laughs> Okay, now, I hope you're going to hear me. The Pierce, the older Pierces, who are all passed away, told me this secret story. And they promised me, or I promised them I wouldn't tell it until they were all gone. So they're all gone. So the story was that each boat would take out a, a string quartet with them to provide music for this very difficult, hard work to make things go a little easier. <coughs> See, melodious music works. See that load of abalone? <laughs> and if you don't believe that, I don't know what, what, what I can do to help you. Uh, here's a smaller boat. They probably had a trio in there. <laughs> there's a helmet coming off. Again, I bet she doesn't have a safety line. This is the pickup boat again and the uh, dive boat. Now, anybody who's come back from San Miguel to the Windy Lane 
uh, knows what this is all about. It's something you don't really want to do very often, if at all. And uh, the boat operator is up uh, high because he had to be when they were diving for abalone so he could see the hose all the time and, and keep it out of the propeller, hopefully. So he was up there, good weather or bad. And uh, I said to Bob Benton, who was aboard the boat at the time, what, what were you doing? He said, oh, we're, we're just sitting below drinking coffee. I said, yeah, sure you were. You couldn't keep coffee in a cup and waves like that if you had to. <laughs> so those were eight or nine knot specials. So imagine how long they'd be out there getting pounded. Now here's a guy who sent up his last load and he put a few abalone on his helmet. <laughs> now they're being peeled off. Now this is Bob Benton, Ted's younger brother. See, they, they've gone to pleasure boats now uh, for bigger size and more weight-carrying capability. And you know where that's taken off of? Malibu. In the early 50s, yeah, Malibu. Now this is Phil Whiteoff, and this is the beginning of the change in the era of diving gear. He had been a Navy diver, and... Uh, he did not like that suit. It was a Desco dry suit. Isn't that right, Leslie? Um, and I had used it, and it's just a horrible thing to be involved in. So in 1946, he wanted to get back in, this is the Newport Beach, he wanted to get back into the abalone business. So he invented the white, the white off mask. Don, could you put the pointer on the mask? Right there. It was all bronze, it was a big glass plate, and it had rubber on the inside to shield the diver's face from the bronze. And then there was a valve there called a one-way valve that was on the side of the helm, on the side of that mask, which only let air in and not air out. And we'll see how important that was in just a minute. Then he has on coveralls. Whoops, could you go back one place? He has on coveralls because they, they got rid of the uh, heavy gear, obviously. And they would make their own dry suits out of slabs of rubber they get and glue them together to fit the diver's size. And he's, he's wearing fins in 1946. He said, I was the only one that wore them, and uh, nobody else would. And, uh, okay, next. This is a diver getting in the back entry of the dry suit. They, they tie it off so water wouldn't come in. And here's a diver with the white off mask and a 65 pound weight belt. And they wore galoshes over their feet to protect them feet from the uh, bottom, or protect their suit rather. And off he go. Now this is a historically incredibly important photograph. How's that for a build up? <laughs> uh, those are both latter day white off masks. That is, the, the bronze have been replaced by rubber. And the one on the left here, yeah, has, is what was called an open flow. That means it took a huge compressor to constantly shove air through there. On a, so the diver always had enough air no matter how deep he was. And there was a lot of wastage there. The air would come out around his mask and uh, uh, it was just a, it's all they had at the time. Now, somebody got the bright idea uh, to put a second stage regulator from a scuba rig in the front of the white off mask. Well, that's meant that the diver would only breathe air from the mouthpiece when he needed it. So what did that mean? A much smaller compressor and more, less gas and carrying more abalone. That was the idea. And uh, so that went on, if you, on your way out tonight, at the foot of the, the uh, stairs here, um, you'll see this abalone display, and or not, not abalone display, the commercial diving display, and then half of the mask, half of the helmets there have the still have the uh, single stage, second stage rather regulator in the front. That this was a huge contribution to the world of diving, but nobody knew it at the time.
Now, he had a bad day at the office. <laughs> and he, he, the reason I mentioned the one-way valve was because this man was wearing a mask, fortunately, and the valve failed, and the air rushed back out from the mask to the outside, so it would draw everything inside the mask out, try, try to get through the hole, and there were occasions when their eyes were popped out. And then, in that case, they would put them on the deck, put a wet cloth over their face, take them back to Santa Barbara, and the doctor would put the eyes back in, and he'd be back at work in a week or two. <laughs> so these guys didn't mess around. Now, if that happened, and you're wearing a heavy gear suit, let, let's talk about that for a second, because this is when it really gets gory. Uh, the only thing rigid in a heavy gear suit is what? The breastplate and the helmet, right? So everything else is soft and pliable. So if the heavy, if the one-way valve failed, all the air in the suit would try and do what? Go out the small opening. And what would that do to the suit and the diver's body? Push him up into the helmet. Now that happened off of Morro Bay one time and killed killed the diver. Uh, I know of one, one of the piercers told me that he had a tiny leak in his uh, one-way valve and he didn't realize it until he got down and he could kind of feel the pressure a little bit. And it turned out that there was a piece of rubber caught in there that was letting a slow leak. He said, I was black and blue from here to here for two weeks. And he's, he's, he was lucky to be alive. The main danger on the bottom was uh, basically your crew had to get a good crew and not get your hose wrapped up in the, the wheel when it was when you were operating. That was the main danger. Now these are two shark bites on a, on a fin and a booty. And I, I looked at those very closely and it, I would defy anybody to find a, a scalpel that could make a finer slice than that. They're that the teeth are that sharp. And I got to thinking about it the diver got his foot cut just a little bit and then went back to work, or went back to his boat. And uh, I got to thinking about it, no heavy gear diver was ever attacked by a white shark. I think, well, that's kind of strange. No, it's not, because if, it, if a white shark thought, or if they think, uh, saw a heavy gear diver on the bottom with this weird looking ensemble uh, outfit on, all these bubbles coming out, and he's bent over like this, plodding along. He say, "Boy, that sure doesn't look like, look like it's on my menu." <laughs> and interestingly enough, the white shark's attacks on divers and and uh, surfers didn't start until the wetsuit was invented, for obvious reasons. Here's a diver who just ha harvested a nice big red. Now this is Danny Wilson about to make his famous 400 foot dive off Santa Cruz Island. He was breathing a special mix that he had gotten out of the of, uh, Navy diving manual and modified it to his needs. And it was helium and oxygen. And he had a second stage regulator inside the hat so he wouldn't have too much of this expensive gas running around. And so he went down 400 feet and it was very clear-headed because normally if you go down oh, 130 or 40 breathing regular air with the nitrogen in it, you get very silly and you can kill yourself. But he was clear as clear as thinking it could be. So the oil companies thought this was the greatest thing in the world because they could send divers down now to, to deeper depths, work at deeper depths, and get more oil. So he was an abalone diver. Again, this was another huge contribution from the abalone divers to the world of commercial diving. This is a green being picked at uh, San Clemente, green abalone. This is Bev Morgan's boat. Uh, he'd spend 30 days at a time on that, and uh, he slept in, the, in that pipe rack up, up above there, and uh, he put his abalone on, and a pickup boat would come out and take him and exchange food and water, etc., and uh, wine. 
And uh, <laughs> I asked him, what, what did you do when, you, when there was nothing else to do? He said, I read every book John Steinbeck ever wrote. <laughs> so now this is <clears throat> Al Hansen, who was one of the best heavy gear divers ever. Don, could you point out his bailout bottle on his left hip? Yeah, right there. And he made his own helmet. Uh, so you see the great big ports in him? Okay, next. You had to be good to get in the water that way. Very good. There was a, in Avalon, there was a uh, underwater or glass bottom boat that he would put on demonstrations. He would turn upside down in his heavy gear suit and walk on the bottom of the glass. Oh. And the tourists couldn't even believe it. Now, I can't figure whether this guy's getting in or getting out. Yeah. I figure he's getting in. Yeah. Uh, Don, would you, would you point out the uh, bendomatic? On his arm, right there. That, that's what we used. We, that was the first um, decompression meter. People made a lot of fun of, but uh, I understand it was tested and proved to be rather accurate. That's Castle Rock in the background at uh, Morro Bay, at uh, San Miguel. Here's a diver with an abalone he just harvested. Now, this is a Radden boat. That came out of the abalone industry also. It was invented by Ron Radden, and uh, he was called Superman because he was such an animal on the bottom in getting abalone. Nobody could beat the guy. But he invented this boat, and its, and its main uh, strengths were extreme seaworthiness, load carrying ability, and uh, speed. So what this meant for the abalone divers was if they were at San Miguel, for example, and the weather changed, they could get everybody on the boat and then zoom down to Santa Rosa or the next island and be back and work in 45 minutes. Whereas in the old days, with the old uh, eight or nine knot specials, you had to go find a sheltered cove and ride out the storm. So uh, this, was a, this is still used widely today by the Sea Urchin fleet. Now this is Wen Swint, who on his radin, looks like it must be a cave off Santa Cruz. Now he was killed by being wrapped. And he was an urchin, an urchin diver and a sailboat from out of, out of the area drove over his hose and wrapped him up and killed him. He's a great guy. Well, there was, well we get to try to progress the men. Some people were almost immune to him. And other people were very susceptible to them, but what we did, everybody had a different, we had a scale that you had to go to, depending on how deep you worked and how long you were working, to get hang off. And we had a ball with different stages, a 10, 20, and 30 foot stage. You come up to 30 feet, spend so much time at 30 feet, and then your operator would tell you it's time to move up to the 20 foot so much time and then 10 foot and then onto the, onto the boat. Did every sea diver have his own particular little method that you're getting bends? That said, everybody had their own solution to the bends. Some of them worked and some of them, most of them didn't, but some would jog and, and myself personally, I used to, before I, end of the day, I'd have a couple of spoons full of honey and I figured that would do us. <laughs> <laughs> Exercise, it didn't work all the time. <laughs> Sometimes it did, but everybody had a different method. Bob told me he was bent 20 to 30 times, so he must have been using the wrong kind of honey. <laughs> <laughs> and the California Abalone Association tried to have a grow out program, that is, grow bigger abalone from babies, and they used it, they hung these things underneath the uh, oil rigs out here uh, and would put a kelp in them. Next. And here's Wynn Swin again with the, the baby abalone. But it didn't work because they had to be placed individually on the bottom, and a baby abalone has too many enemies down there to uh, have a chance for survival. This is the inside. 
of a red shell, the beautiful iridescent color that you see every so often in jewelry. Now, this is a piece of black abalone. <clears throat> black abalone means it's black on the outer shell only, and it has this beautiful uh, creamy white material on the inside, and somebody made it into a uh, uh, unicorn. And here's another piece of jewelry that made is made from a red shell. Now, how many have, have done this? Okay, so uh, you can see the uh, sliced abalone up there, the big one, the big hunk. It's all been cleaned off and ready to go. And then it's been sliced and then pounded down here in front and then put in the egg wash up up above over over there there you go and then put in the cracker crumbs and breadcrumbs here and then fried quickly on both sides and there's a and that's it and I tell you uh, that is so good because I I'm preaching to the choir when I say that I understand uh, Okay, well, one more thing before we close. Uh, in seven years of research on this, I collected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photos from the, from the old timers primarily and also some of the new timers and uh, the, the family films and whatnot. But we would not have this program tonight in this form were it not for the efforts of Don Barthelmas. So let's have a nice hand for Don. So I thank you very much for coming, and I know the museum does also, and uh, I'll be outside if anybody wants to buy a book and sign up for you or answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you.